there has been much interest in the development of cyclin and cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors for the past uh, 25, 30 years. Ever since the discovery and the, of the cell cycle and, and the understanding of how critical an impact the cell cycle has on, on uh, the development and progression of cancer. In breast cancer in particular, uh, over the past uh, 10, 15 years, we have noticed that uh, certain cyclins like cyclin D1 are amplified in some breast cancers and that the cyclin, cyclin dependent kinase complexes are uh, dysregulated in many types of breast cancer and, and other cancers, of course, but we are talking about breast cancer today. So because of that, there has been interest in de developing modulators of cyclin and cyclin dependent kinases. The first uh, generation of them was very nonspecific and resulted in uh, um, much toxicity and relatively little therapeutic activity. And then about uh, 10 years ago, a new generation of cyclin dependent uh, kinases that focused on uh, CDK4 and 6 were developed. Uh, those were palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemacyclib. And uh, in preclinical uh, experiments, they were shown to have a particularly prominent anti tumor effect in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative cell lines. As a result of that, these three entered a, a, an accelerated clinical uh, pathway. And all three of them started uh, with randomized trials after a relatively brief uh, phase one dose seeking uh, uh, phase. And so uh, that was the background. Uh, in um, in uh, 2012, um, a, a, a few collaborators uh, um, from the Southwest Oncology Group and, and uh, Novartis Pharmaceuticals and I were at the meeting and uh, were very excited about these prospects where we designed the Mona Lisa II as a, a large uh, phase three randomized trial in which uh, the, uh, the, the drug ribocyclib in this case, would be combined with the letrozole, a aromatase inhibitor, and compared to letrozole plus placebo in a double-blind randomized trial. So that was the origin of it. Um, in, in a rather atypical manner, the protocol development progressed very quickly. And uh, by January 2013, uh, less than uh, eight months from the, the moment we had this concept, there was a, an approved protocol and ready to recruit patients. And over the next 14 months, we recruited uh, 668 uh, postmenopausal women with hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer who had received no prior treatment. And uh, uh, closed recruitment in uh, March uh, 2014. Um, and then we reported the first results uh, at the ESMO presidential session in 2016, showing that the addition of ribocyclid had a significant, uh, both clinically and statistically significant benefit um, on this group of patients by prolonging the duration of disease control, uh, which we also call progression-free survival by more than a year. And, um, and a year later, a second analysis confirmed that. And then we had to wait until the data matured because of course, uh, survival data take some time after uh, because after progression, patients receive additional treatments and, and eventually um, enough events occur so that the survival can be analyzed. So the, the survival analysis uh, for this trial was based on a database that was closed in June this year, so very recently. And uh, the data were positive enough to submit to 
ESMO, and that's what I'm presenting uh, now. As I mentioned, the progression-free survival data from 2016 showed that um, the uh, control arm or placebo arm had a medium progression-free survival of 16 months and the ribocyclic plus letrozole arm a medium progression-free survival of 25 months, a hazard ratio of uh, 0.56 and a highly significant p-value. Now, the overall survival uh, um, is uh, much longer in this group of patients. So um, this analysis showed that the placebo arm had a median mm -hmm. overall survival of 51 months, and the ribocyclic arm had a median survival of uh, 63.9, or uh, close to 64 months. And that difference was uh, greater than 12 months. The hazard ratio was 0.76, which represents about a 24% reduction in uh, survival events or deaths. And this was associated with a, a p-value that exceeded the, the minimal requirement for declaring statistically uh, the superiority of the ribocyclic arm. So the, the, the survival curves start to separate around the 24 months and continue to uh, spread over a long time, which is reassuring because, of course, uh, sometimes we see early separation of survival curves only for them to come together at a later time, abrogating the treatment advantage. That does not seem to be happening here. And um, we have patients who are still in, on, on the drug 84 months after starting. Uh, so that also speaks about the safety and tolerability of the agent. So that was the, the major finding. The second important finding is that the, the actual advantage seems to increase with time. So if you look at the separation of the curves, there's an absolute difference of about 5.7 months at 48 months, 8.4 months at 60 months, and 12.2 months at 72 months. So the difference continues to increase. Um, a third uh, important observation is that there were no new safety events and that the the side effects or safety uh, uh, events that were observed during the first year were uh, the same that uh, um, the entire study uh, uh, showed. So there's no cumulative increase in toxicity. There are no new toxicities observed. Uh, the major safety events continue to be laboratory findings of uh, reduction in uh, white blood cell counts and uh, absolute neutrophils and some uh, uh, reversible liver function abnormalities. The subjective symptoms uh, are relatively modest and include fatigue, occasional diarrhea, um, uh, some uh, nausea perhaps, uh, um, so nothing relatively, uh, nothing really new. And there are a couple of rare events. Uh, one of them is a laboratory event, which is uh, a, an electrocardiographic abnormality, which occurs in about uh, uh, less than 5% of patients and has no clinical consequences. And then uh, what is called inter interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis, which occurs in less than 1% uh, uh, of patients. Um, so <clears throat> none of this is new. Uh, we've known this since 2016 from the very first analysis, and there has not been worsening. And on the contrary, we know that all of these changes are reversible once treatment uh, is modified, either by reduction of the dose or discontinuation. So to put this in context, uh, now we have three large randomized trials with ribocyclic, the Monolisa 2, the Monolisa 3, and Monolisa 7. Those two matured earlier because they were at the later stage in metastatic or advanced disease 
and they also showed a highly significant prolongation of overall survival. So now we have three uh, separate uh, individual randomized trials, which all show the same thing, a highly significant prolongation of progression-free survival and a highly significant prolongation of overall survival. And uh, having focused on different populations, we know that this combination works on postmenopausal women, on premenopausal women, on first line therapy, on second line therapy, and previously treated and previously untreated. So um, this is this triad of uh, the trials is very reassuring because it's uh, the results are very homogeneous and equally exciting in all three. So on the basis of that, and until further notice, uh, uh, we are very encouraged by this data and consider that this should be uh, the preferred approach to uh, advanced hormone receptor positive breast cancer. There are three of these drugs, CDK46 inhibitors. Initially, we thought that they were identical and uh, uh, sort of interchangeable. As, uh, as time progresses, we have uh, to learn that there are differences between the three agents. They have differences in pharmacokinetics. They, they have differences in, um, <clears throat> in some of the uh, safety aspects. And uh, recently there uh, have been uh, initial results uh, reported about the use of these drugs in the uh, primary breast cancer setting. And there, uh, there seem to be uh, uh, not so subtle differences, at least between carbocyclib and abemacyclib. Uh, the ribocyclib adjuvant trial has not reported us yet on the PI of that one. So we are still waiting for that to mature. So uh, that's why I, I said with some caution that for the time being and until all of the data are in, I, I believe that based on the three studies I mentioned, the ribocyclic letrozole approach should be the preferred choice. But there is the possibility if the other two uh, report their phase three trials and the survival data of their phase three trials that, that, that uh, the situation might uh, modify again. Um, and of course, we are very excited about, about looking at these drugs in the adjuvant setting. Uh, so uh, I think it's an exciting time for this group of patients. The Mona Lisa 2 is the first study that uh, broke the five-year overall survival ceiling, sort of. And um, uh, just to tell you how uh, old I am, uh, when I started in oncology in 1974, the survival, the median survival expectation for this group of patients was 18 months. And now we have just broken um, 64 months. Uh, so I, I think that is substantial, substantial progress. And we are, I am and my colleagues and co-authors are very excited about these data. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased for the improvement in the prognosis for our patients. Thank you.